All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is the ninth meeting of the New Bedford Light Fine Arts Club, the uh, seventh in person. And uh, once again, we have an incredible batch of talented artists. It's a mix of first time presenters, and then we have a couple of club veterans here who are presenting for the second or third time. And I know I can't wait to hear the unique stories of how they found their passion, what inspires them, and how they make these incredible works of art a reality. Quickly, a little bit about the New Bedford Light. We just celebrated our second birthday in June. As a non-profit, non-partisan online news outlet, we are dedicated to informing readers about important issues in Greater New Bedford. When we're not tracking down landlords for stories on rising rents, or putting in public records requests about police misconduct, or shedding light on the inner workings of the waterfront, we strive to celebrate the cultural richness that makes New Bedford such a special place. And that's what brings us here to the Fine Arts Club. It's inspired by the Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club. Thanks to Ron Forty over there, he uh, introduced us to the idea, and uh, we took it from there. So this is a, we offer a place for artists to gather, share their experiences, give us a peek into their process, and of course, sell some art. Everything you see today is for sale. That means you can take home anything that catches your eye or stirs your spirit. All you have to do is talk to the artist after the presentations, or you can use the contact information uh, in the handouts. There's also, uh, we have a website, uh, it's newbedfordlight.org slash fineartsclub, and all the con artist contact information is there as well. And then we hope you stick around after the presentations for the Afterglow, which is a loosely moderated discussion about the local arts. I also want to mention that uh, there's an ongoing exhibit here at the Co-Creative Center. It's uh, I Am Not My Season by John Jameson, and he was actually a presenter at our first in-person Fine Arts Club meeting um, at DOCO last summer. And this is his first solo exhibition in seven years. Um, he'll be holding a workshop and demo on July 27th, and an artist talk and closing reception on August 10th. So come check those out. Now uh, let's welcome our hosts, two talented artists in their own rights. Devin Yvette McLaughlin is a multifaceted artist based here in New Bedford. <laughs> he uses an array of styles and mediums in his art, ranging from classical to abstract. Native to South Coast New England, he finds an endless source of inspiration in the surrounding mix of post-industrial cities, rural landscapes, and the Atlantic. Nivet's passions lie in connecting and developing creative communities and cultivating an appreciation for the arts. He is frequently involved in teaching painting workshops and educating individuals through schools, museums, and private instruction. Scott Bishop. He's a musician, songwriter, and a sound sculptor creating music under the name Skeet Ghost. Is uh, still your latest release? Uh, might be, uh, At this point, yeah. Okay, New Bedford Ways, created with support from the New Bedford Whaling National Historic Park, features new music created from samples of sounds recorded around New Bedford. He also curates, uh, are they still ongoing music series? Yeah. I should have double checked my bio here with you. <laughs> the Seaport Sessions for AHA New Bedford and Unexpected Music. In addition to his music work, Scott hosts and moderates the co-creative sessions and is a contributor to the In Focus podcast for the Arts Index. He has a BA in illustration from the Savannah College of Art and Design. So here are your hosts. Thank you so much. All right, folks. My name is uh, Devin. I'm going to be one of the hosts tonight. I want to go through a little bit of how this works so that everybody is a little bit familiar and how things are going to operate. Okay. Uh, each artist is going to come up and they're going to talk about two pieces of artwork. Uh, you have your brochures over here that's going to list the artwork. It has their social media, it has the prices of their work in it, um, and it will have some contact information in there. Those are important, so if you don't have one, grab them. I think Leanne's passing a few of those out right now. Uh, the artists will talk for about five minutes, but we have uh, a few artists here, so we can actually talk a little bit longer. We encourage the, you, the guests, ask questions of the artist and the artists talk about their process, who they are, and what their pieces have to do with. Okay? Um, everyone's going to have a vastly different set of work and we want to show all of that and we want you to have any kind of questions answered about that. Um, our first artist up tonight is going to be Andy Tedesco. Uh, Andy is from New Bedford and has a uh, studio downtown, I believe. Is that true, Andy? Yes, sir. Cool. Uh, Andy has his social medias here. 
And uh, the two pieces that are listed in the brochure are not the ones that are here right now. I didn't get my own memo, so I apologize. So, <laughs> uh, so Andy, you're gonna have to fill us in on what the, uh, the media and everything is on those. But um, please talk to Andy after if you guys did have an interest in buying anything. If anybody does buy any piece of artwork, let us know because we will ring a bell to celebrate that we have sold a piece and we want to keep track so we know how much we're helping the community. But any sold pieces are going to be individual private sales between the artist and you, the buyer. Does that sound good? Yes? All right, cool. Um, <laughs> uh, and a quick note, uh, I mentioned this earlier. Please silence your phones so that you don't have any uh, ringing interruptions. If you are up here and you're an artist talking, please keep the mic low to your mouth and right in front of you and speak loudly, project a little bit so that we can hear it. And if you're asking a question from the audience, wave to us and we'll let you use one of the mics. We wanna make sure everything is recorded on the mic because this is all gonna go online and the recordings come out a lot better when we have good audio. Sound good, yes? Yeah. All right, thanks guys. So Andy, you wanna come on up and talk about your work? Well, I literally was just gonna ask, like, do you want me to use this thing? And I do, I do, yes. Yes, yes. I understand that you want me to use this thing so that way it can all be recorded. Of course. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I am Andy Sesco. I am a painter out of New Bedford. Uh, I apologize that I did not get my own memo for which paintings I was supposed to bring. So I apologize that the paintings that are in your brochure are not the two paintings that you have before you right now, but uh, Oculus and Tori are still for sale if those two happen to uh, pique anyone's interest. Um, so the two that I have here are, uh, this piece is titled uh, Mother. Uh, this is from uh, a body of work that kind of continues my idea from uh, grad school, uh, which kind of like the elevator pitch for that body of work uh, is that it's called Dead Space, uh, where it is a, a dead culture within a dead space. Um, the, the liner notes of that is that uh, I lost my mom, uh, in, uh, that she passed in a hospital, so uh, she is my, uh, my direct uh, tie to my Filipino culture. Um, so the, the figures are uh, represent, uh, representations of uh, gods, goddesses, de deities from uh, Filipino folklore, which, um, you know, if as far as the, the history serves us, is not very much uh, talked about through the uh, colonization of the Philippines thanks to the Spaniards. So, yay, history. <laughs> um, so in this particular piece, uh, that it is uh, kind of this uh, mother-like figure that is like wrapped her her body around her child in kind of like this uh, tuberculo tuberculosis bed um, in a tuberculosis ward. Um, in uh, the way that I've represented the figures that are in this body of work is that the 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 figures. Uh, are abstracted with uh, different uh, animal skull heads that the, the animal skulls are uh, used as kind of like a conduit for um, what the different animals represent that are kind of then representations of the, the different god, goddess, deity, um, where uh, it, it tends to be that crocodiles are very maternal. Um, so, so with that kind of being, that kind of overarching theme uh, that I use, uh, I use obviously the, the crocodile skull to to manifest and be represent uh, be representative of this uh, this goddess of like motherhood and um, pretty much pretty much along those lines. Um, the uh, the portrait is uh, titled Petals, um, where this is kind of like the second overhaul of this painting, and it might get a third if it still stays in my grasp for any time longer. Um, that, uh, that I've always enjoyed um, integrating text into, into my artwork. That has very much been something that uh, I, in, in my personal pursuit of gaining my MFA, that I had to fight for for my stance on how I would use text. And then it would be funny that in the, the back channels that me and uh, other artists that, you know, we're, that, that it's all like, oh, after, you know, after all the teachers leave, it's like, all right, let's have our, our coffee or our alcoholic beverage and be like, all right, so how does everyone feel and how beat up do you feel? <laughs> and to hear uh, different professors like praise another artist over their use of text and then you're like, so I just battled y'all for like a half hour over my use of text and then you just, you know what I mean, we go two studios down and you're pretty much just like, 
oh, we, we love the way that you use text over here. And I'm all like, what, what happened just like 15 minutes ago? Um, and with uh, also being, at, at, as far as being a visual artist, I'm also a poet, so I'm very much drawn to poetry um, and lyrics, so I, I tend to also imbue uh, a bunch of different pieces with either poetry or uh, some lyrics. Um, and then just kind of as like uh, the ballpark figures on these two paintings that Mother uh, goes for two grand and that uh, Petals goes for three. Was, was that concise enough? Yeah. That was wonderful, Andy. Um, so now, uh, at this point, we would open up to questions. If anybody has any questions about specific works or about Andy and himself. <laughs> yeah. uh, what kind of media do you use to create your work? Like, is it acrylic or is it, it seems like these two are mixed media, but are those also mixed media? So I'm very much like uh, everything but the kitchen sink kind of painter. Um, so in, in Mother, the, the gold is uh, aerosol uh, on top of uh, kind of like a work surface, which I, for what I can recall for this painting being made in like 2015, that uh, I would work a surface with like charcoal and then I would seal it with like an acrylic medium so that way it would stay on the surface. Um, and that the design is essentially just that I taped off that under layer and then sprayed over it. Um, a lot of a lot of mother is pretty much mainly acrylic, along with some of that uh, that dry media uh, mixed with an acrylic medium to seal it. Um, Petals uh, has a little bit more has kind of a similar approach. That there's a lot of aerosol, uh, also that uh, a good portion of it's a lot of stencil work um, with aerosol, um, acrylic. Um, and then I do tend to just work dry for like an underpainting and then seal and just kind of keep keep this process of working it to death. <laughs> awesome, do we have any other questions? I have one. Uh, you said that uh, you said this, you've done this twice now. Yes. What was the original and what did you add to it? Uh, so I pretty much reworked over the head and then uh, there was a, a studio accident that the, the painting got damaged so I had to uh, patch it and then uh, kind of like repaint over like a couple of areas. Like if you come around to the back and like take a look at it, you'll see the, you'll see the big patch on it. So it's not a separate painting. It's not a new reiteration of it. It is a rework of the very original. Yes. Very cool. Where uh, I actually started this painting when I did my uh, residency at the parks. Um, so this painting is very, very much different from when I kind of started that painting. And I had it very much still with the same idea where I was working in my head with the same text, um, but the text never made its way into that iteration of the painting. Um, so when it kind of like went back onto the chopping block that uh, I was just like, all right, well, well let's, let's try the text this time around. So I have two questions about that piece. Uh, the first one would be, you said that it was something that you reworked. Is it, in your mind, considered finished, or do you think that you would continue working it if you lose up to your own devices? Oh, this is a Giacometti conundrum of, like, it's not gonna, it, it'll probably be done when someone finally does just take it out of my hands. <laughs> and uh, the other question was, uh, the significance of the words that you chose for that piece, uh, how does that relate to you? What's the, what's the deeper meaning here? Uh, so the uh, the text that is in this painting um, is from uh, an English like he's kind of a rapper but also kind of like a spoken word poet that like his work kind of like plays in like the duality of like those two things um, where considering his name tells that uh, it if I can read my own meanderings that it's a uh, pluck your petals pluck my petals. Uh, until there's nothing left, uh, let's be scared and uh, let's be scared and bare like newborns or buried seeds. Let's begin again. Um, when I was reworking this painting, it it was very much at kind of like this. I still kind of feel like I'm in this like transitory period, along with like this kind of. rebirth of, of the way that I'm like viewing painting that like 
I, I feel that like some of my old, some of like the devices of which, you know what I mean, are, are kind of just like things that I've been taught over, you know what I mean, through academia, I feel like don't really like serve me as much. Like I work a lot of, I, I work primarily with, you know what I mean, a lot of stuff that's just like right out of the tube that I'm not like so much like fixated on, you know what I mean, the, the nuances of, of value that I can, that, it's st still the things that I, I, I concern myself with is like light and value, but I don't necessarily concern myself with it to a degree that I'm like, you know what I mean, focusing on just like color mixing for all of these like gradients that I'm, I'm very much just trying to, to grow through the, through the action <clears throat> versus the, I, where, you know what I mean, there, there are some, some folks like, like Cat Nuts and that like, their, their active color mixing is very much as much an active part of painting as the actual painting part is. Uh, and for me, I feel that my active participation in the painting process is constantly is constantly the act. And whether that be additive or reductive, because sometimes I'll just take an orbital sander and I'll just lay it down half the painting and then we'll, we'll go from there. Andy, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, if, you, uh, if you want the uh, work that you see here, you can catch Andy at the Afterglow. The Afterglow is going to be our, uh, our little after party that we have here, where you can meet with the artists, talk to them about their works, ask any additional questions that weren't answered now. And uh, so, Andy, if you could help, we're going to take these and put them in the next room over, where we'll have uh, the artist set up. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Scott. Scott's going to introduce our next artist. All right, that's better. Um, thank you for coming out tonight. Our next artist is Jim Walstenholm from Tiverton, Rhode Island. Jim, if you could come up and we'll get your work on the easels. Jim has two pieces of work. The first is Snow Squalls, which is six by eight inches. The description's a whimsical array of purple, white, and blue metallic brush strokes on a black background. That one is for sale for $200. And the other one is Musical Chaos. 11 by 14, a random pattern of purple and blue metallic board paint on a metallic white background. That is going for $300. And now, here's Jim. Good evening. Sorry I was a little late. I didn't expect all the traffic and car shows. And, um, so I walked quite a bit. My car is way down there somewhere. Um, thank you for having me. I was supposed to be here last month, but six weeks or so. Two surgeries and uh, an office procedure, um, and I'm here tonight. So I apologize for not making it last time, but I was supposed to be here. Um, <clears throat> started painting during COVID. Um, that's an extra money on Amazon. Decided I've been painting boats and houses my whole life, so why not try to paint canvases? Um, like my predecessor, I'm a writer, I was working on a book at the time as well, and I thought, well, if I could do my own cover work and illustrations and um, and graphics and chapter headings and stuff, um, I'd be, you know, that'd be a good thing. So I uh, <clears throat> purchased a paint by number kit, believe it or not. Um, my boss at my weekend job wanted to keep us all um, in touch with each other, so she had weekly Zoom sessions. And I um, was showing them, and one night one of my colleagues said something about going outside the lines, and that was kind of the start of things. So um, I am basically an acrylic still. Uh, I am going through every sort of um, technique, um, instrument. Um, so I actually, oh, I didn't bring it up, excuse me a second. So I'm fortunate to have now five colleagues at work who are artists, and um, we, we tend to pass stuff by each other. Uh, one of my friends is a, um, <clears throat> an abstract artist, huge abstracts. Um, I'm hoping to get everybody at Gallery X next time. It was supposed to be the last show, but um, we never got there because of what I previously mentioned. Um, and the other fellow is kind of realist, and we're, we're all kind of manipulating right now, going back and forth. And one day I was talking to my abstract artist friend about, um, and he was telling me he often uses, you know, the ketchup and mustard bottles you use at picnics. Mm -hmm. And so I said, all right, 
So I took a canvas one day and I did this. I went back and dug it out and um, I thought, well, that's pretty cool. And then I stopped because I tend to go overboard and put more on there than I should. And I looked at it and I said, oh, geez, I don't think the canvas was prepped. <laughs> so this became this. And um, started to look at it, and I have a nautical background and a musical background as well. So I started looking at this one, and then I saw some March winds possibly, and then I don't remember how it turned into snow squalls, and that's what stuck. So weather, music, nautical um, themes are kind of what I tend to do. And then a few days later, I said, well, I was going to do the black squiggle, so why don't I try it again, and I prepped the uh, Another canvas that I happened to have, a little larger, and I prepped it with a white metallic background. And um, for whatever reason, I started with purple, it's my favorite color, and then a little blue. And I was gonna uh, go a little bit further and maybe do the black. And then I said, No, I'm gonna stop and put it on Facebook. And one of my old high school friends said, Oh, he, uh, he was a uh, music teacher, and we were in the band, orchestra, and everything together. And he said, Oh, musical chaos. So that stuck. Um, that's it, pretty much. <laughs> That's what I got. Not, not very, not very deep. I feel bad after that big explanation, but that's kind of what I got. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> so you're using the mustard to put some <laughs> bottles for that? I actually did not. I did it right out of the bottle, but the same, the same principle. <laughs> anyone else have questions? Um, I wanted to ask, did you start out of the gate using metallic paints? Uh, no, I didn't. I just used um, a regular um, box of foreign paints. And then um, I kind of progressed and went through a series of a lot of different metallic ones. And then my last question is, did you jump right to abstraction out of the gate when your friend said color outside the lines? I did, yeah. Went and I, I don't remember if it was, um, I think I started because I went back through my phone before coming here and looked at some of the pictures and the dates of them and everything. And um, yeah, I believe I did five or six pours and then started doing some um, uh, palette knife work and some kitchen knife work and some sponge work and um, then proceeded into uh, the, the pouring kind of things, setting up a canvas outside, throwing at it. Um, had a couple nice ones come out that way. And uh, most recently, last fall, I started doing, I saw it online, so I started doing it um, where you switch two canvases, I don't know what the proper term is, where you switch two canvases together, you do background of both and then do a design. And I did some really nice Christmas kind of decomposed um, poinsettia plants and things at Christmas by doing the backgrounds on two and then switching them together. And sometimes they come out mirror, sometimes they come out exact, and depends on how you manipulate the canvas. Beautiful. Jim, thank you so much. going to be uh, Peter Turk. Peter Turk's out of New Bedford, Massachusetts, um, and he has two pieces he's going to be showing. Uh, he also brought a bunch of uh, prints and cards as well, so at the afterglow you can take a look at those. The two pieces that are in the uh, brochure are going to be um, a frame piece with findings that is 15 by 7 by 2 inches, a shadow box that has some depth to it, and we also have another piece here which is a frame piece with watch findings and dials. Uh, one goes for two hundred dollars. One goes for two hundred fifty dollars. And I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you. Actually, I am not from New Bedford. Just moved here a little over a year ago from Salt Lake City. Um, I'm originally British. Grew up in North Africa, Ethiopia, but married a Bostonian, <laughs> so that's how we ended up back here. Um, and we love it. Um, painting outside the lines. What a beautiful comment. Uh, I do a lot of classic model building, you know, little race cars. I'm currently building the Cuddy Sark, which it's about a thousand hour project, but I do it outside the lines. I don't take the planes, I look at the ship, look at pictures, figure out how to do it like it should be. The neat thing about this kind of art is there are no rules, so you can kind of interpret what you want. 
My skate park started as collage work. Um, I do a lot of larger 3D pieces, uh, which have won awards. Um, we were very involved, my wife and we were very involved in the arts community in Northern California, helped run a 301C art group out there. A lot of very talented people, and we got to see the same similar beautiful work, creative work that a lot of artists do. I enjoy steampunk a lot because, again, you can interpret it in many ways. For those that don't know, steampunk is a genre. It's written word, it's clothing, it's people punking out their cars. For me, it's uh, working a lot with Victorian art and interpreting some of my uh, watch pieces and those sorts of things. What I do with these is I'll actually find pictures of watches and magazines. So I can then uh, make them bigger, smaller, um, put them on nice photographic paper, and then cut them out. So there's lots of circles, lots of cut out circles, and then add in jewelry findings, watch parts, unique papers for the borders. Um, and I've got quite a few. In addition to that, I do I did bring some smaller pieces, some cards, some five by seven cards, and those items. So if you don't want to spend this much money, you do have smaller items. Um, yeah, I I play around a lot with art. Um, and you can ask my wife. Right, I go into uh, Walmart or Kmart and buy a little fish that kids play with, the sharks, the whales. Totally transition those. And I am putting up a website that is in the works. Eventually all that work will be up there. That way it can be shared more. All right, did we have any questions? What do you do with the perfect circles? With a, uh, the uh, Alpha, actually, I like Alpha, Alpha tools if you're familiar with Alpha blades. But they make a little circle color that you can adjust dimensions on. And, you know, I've gotten down to kind of like 16th inch little circles that you can see in some of these pieces. I have a lot of tools. Very nice. Any other questions? Where do you source all the watch parts? Nowadays, you can just go online and buy packets with lots of watch parts. So early on when I started doing yeah, the steam park, I was going to yard sales. You get a lot of neat things at yard sales, findings and those sorts of things. So I've built uh, big pieces under dollhouse domes that I bought for five bucks at the yard sale. I have a question for you. Um, so when you're out and about and you see something that sparks your interest, is it that that informs the artwork or do you go out hunting for pieces because you have an idea in mind? A little bit of both. <laughs> I'll go crazy at times trying to find things. I'm on a mission right now with the, the ship I'm building because I really want it to be pretty much as accurate and look as good as it comes and the plans are off. So I'm now reaching out to the Facebook gang and buying a couple of books. I'll get what I need. Do you find that uh, the access that we have through the internet now makes it easier for you to source pieces and find what you need? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless there's a quote to it. There's a quote to it. Oh, this is, oh. So my wife's a fabric artist, and that was bad for her because she took me to quilt shows. I started spending money on, you find steampunk themed, uh, fabrics that I cut up and mount and add stuff to it. So yeah, uh, fabric shows are terrible for me. <laughs> um, I wanted to kind of also ask you about this. Um, you mentioned that there's a lot of different things in steampunk. A lot of people get inspired in music and cars and things like that. And I know that they do have shows and that there's a big community around that. Um, how do you feel your relationship is with the steampunk community? I don't think I'm been as exposed as I could. And again, that's really part of that is, is being online marketing, um, getting your name out there so that when somebody types steampunk in, eventually you bubble to the surface. And 
it's not as big as the community around here that I know. When we lived in Santa Rosa, Northern California, they had rail car regattas and all the steampunk people came out of the closet. Mm -hmm. Very cool. A lot of fun. All right, do we have any other questions? All right, thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Let's take a moment while our next artist gathers her work. She is Renee Govan from Dartmouth. She has two pieces, Kraken's Revenge, 12 by 16 inches, sea life drifting through galaxies, destroying whatever may be in their paths. That is available for $200. And Space Turtle, 8 by 10 inches, a turtle swing through the cosmos, $125. And now, here's Renee. Do you, do you feel that the, the Kraken painting would be more like 
especially considering you view that there are more, there, you know, I mean, that it's not just one crack and that there are, there are multiples of these, um, that you, you know, I mean, versus being one painting, that it could just be a departure for how you would explore this through like a series of them? Yeah, that was kind of the idea is like I started, like I wrote this idea and then I added this to it and I added that to it. And I definitely want to like try exploring more with this series. I do really love that jellyfish. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, I was a little bit curious about, um, actually two things. First, is that glitter on the back of that one? Yes, I got glitter paint because I really liked the effect that it has for the stars. But I got complaints from a few people because I did that one first. And a few people told me they really didn't like the glitter, so I omitted it going forward. I don't care what they think. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the next term is uh, do you. Um, but no, it, it's cool. I didn't even realize it was glitter until I sat down and I'm at an angle where the light's really like reflecting on it, and that's very cool. And for everybody else in the room, I would suggest bobbing your head around. And <laughs> like I know it won't be on the camera as well, but it's worth looking at. Um, and the other question I had was, uh, can you talk a little bit about your history as an artist? Like how you got where you are and where you uh, started? Okay, um, so I don't have any formal training. I have a friend growing up that she taught me a lot of technique because she went to art school and her mom was an artist and her mom taught me painting classes in art classes. So she got me into doing more drawing with colored pencils and whatnot, but I lost the patience for it and I started taking up painting. I do a lot of YouTube videos for how to paint things if I'm not sure how to get the right, the colors to look the right way or um, along those lines. It's very much self-taught, and I just look at other people's techniques and put my own twist on it, usually. Um, Renee, um, do you have other works for sale as well today? Yes, I do. I have a mini version of just this, and I have a octopus and a galaxy background. Uh, it's green. And I did bring some of my digital art prints. They are mostly fan art, so they're not along with this series, but I just figured bring the stuff that's easy to bring with me. <laughs> Any other questions? Renee, thank you so much. <laughs> Next artist is going to be Lisa Goulart out of Dartmouth. Uh, Lisa has her social media listed in the uh, brochure, so please check that out. You have the uh, social media, Instagram, and Facebook on there. Uh, one of the pieces is going to be uh, the owl painting, which is, who are you, owl? Um, that one is a 12 by 16. Uh, that is a watercolor painting adhered to wood, uh, which I hope you talk about because that's really cool in the process. Um, and the other one is a chameleon, hello there which is a 9 by 12 uh, matted and framed. Hello. <laughs> um, I'm great at public speaking, but I'm a self-taught artist. I've always loved to be creative and do creative things. Ever since I was a kid, I loved you know, coloring, drawing, uh, doing crafts, and I would continue that when I had children, doing crafts with them a lot. Um, and then when I got divorced in uh, 2001, the kids were at the father's for the weekend and I was bored, so I went to AC Moore and got painting supplies. That's how I started painting. Uh, acrylics at first, I did pastels for a little while, and then um, in the beginning of 2019, I took a hardcore uh, basic class at the art museum and fell in love with it. I mean, it's like I did it in another life. It was just, just mm. loved it. And then on through the pandemic, that's how I did this paint, paint, paint. Um, I started out with intuitive landscapes, just you know, letting the paint flow freely. And I just love how watercolor just does its own thing sometimes. And trying out different techniques of watercolor, like using salt, um, which I used you know, to get some of the texture on the bark of the thing. And uh, using saran wrap sometimes to get 
texture and looks and stuff. Um, just trying out all these different things and experimenting is the most fun part of art, and especially the some of the intuitive landscapes. You just get lost, just letting it do its thing, and not planning. It's just very meditative, especially during the you know stress of the pandemic. Because I did work through the entire pandemic. I worked at the police department, and it was a stressful, <laughs> stressful job. So this, the, you know, it's a nice outlet for me to uh, just decompress and. So the chameleon, uh, I started doing some whimsical uh, paintings just recently, and I saw a picture of the orange chameleon, and I was like, oh, let me try to draw one, and that was what came out, so I painted him. Um, a lot of masking on both of these. I used a lot of masking fluid, uh, obviously, because there was layers on him, and the owl also takes the white, white, and mask it off, and then layer the paint. And the owl, I was trying something different. I saw something on um, online about mounting watercolor paper on the boards. And then there's a, something called Dorland's Wax Medium that you spread over that so that, you know, it won't, you know, if somebody flicked water, it's not gonna ruin the painting. Because if I took him out of the, you know, there and put water on it, it's gonna ruin because watercolor is delicate like that. But um, I guess that's the way I just, I don't, like I said, I'm with watercolor and I've been doing it and showing my art since 2019 at Gallery X. Um, that's probably it. Anybody have any questions for me? Do you have questions? So I had some. Um, so, did you, did you, I'll uh, go after Okay, great. So, so um, you know, I'm familiar with it because I, I work in watercolors myself sometimes, but um, can you explain a little bit more? You said you were experimenting with uh, masking fluid, and that's something that um, I'm not sure if everybody knows what that is. Yeah. But could you talk about the masking fluid and the salt a little bit more? Okay, so masking fluid is like liquid, like latex kind of thing, and you put it down on the paper where you want to keep the white, because watercolor, you can't, mm -hmm. you know, the dark color, you can't put the white over it, it doesn't, sh you know, you doesn't work because <laughs> it's uh, see-through, transparent mostly. Um, so yeah, uh, I've masked off all the white areas and then I did the background sky and I sprayed, sprayed some water and that makes a little like, texture on the cloud kind of thing. And then the, uh, the little lichen stuff here, that's where I use the salt. So I, I um, the salt, like absorbs the water and paint and like leaves it lighter underneath. So then I was able to put the green and make it kind of look like the lichen. So it provided the texture that goes on. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you. This is just a comment. I, I just want to say that the contrast between these two pieces is so great because the chameleon is so vivid. Mm -hmm. And then the owl is obviously more subdued colors, but it's such a strong composition. It's got its own kind of power. I just want to say seeing this pairing is just, it's, it's tremendous to see the range you have. Thank you. I, I, like I said, I just experimented so much and I have some other paintings uh, in the back and some watercolor <coughs> cards that I make. They're all original watercolor paintings. They fit in a five by seven frame if you want to put it like on your desk or something like that. They, um, and then a lot of them are the looser style because I wanted to show that when I came to, so I have those for after. Anybody wants to see them? <laughs> Wonderful, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next and last artist is Yua Leepwood. This is her third time at the Fine Arts Club, and it's a delight to have you back, Yua. So just take a moment to get her pieces.
I work in oil colors mostly, and uh, they are oil colors except the the blue eyes are uh, Acura blue. I was walking on the street and find small can of the paint, and that was the some uh, matching color for somebody's car. But I like the blue color because. Uh, it can't match exactly the color of the eyes of my brother. So between the time that I submit their work and my brother saw the work, I have announced that the two pieces are not for sale right now because uh, he laughed. It's the story start that uh, uh, I sent him a, a birthday uh, wishes and he sent me, and uh, because he, he had in February, I had in May, and uh, when we talk on the phone, he said, how come that you never paint me? And I said, well, I never thought that you would like to, because I make several portraits for my mother. So I said, yeah, uh, I'm sorry about that, but uh, you're going to get the paintings on my birthday. So they are actually date May 10, which is my birthday. I said, I'm sorry, I was too late to wait for years. And I was surprised that actually he liked it. So the title of the paintings are, it's another uh, thing. Uh, you paint the painting with the model. I believe that good portrait you need to have person to see it. Or you paint from the memory. So uh, this one from memory, I never look at any any photographs because you can't remember your family members. So he somehow goofy face and uh, the title is uh, in English would be Stan or Stanley with Rose and uh, mm, stand with the rose one. And uh, I, I never imagined that, you know, like in a Renaissance uh, portraits, uh, they depict the artist uh, or the person, uh, the artist paint with some object which, you know, very similar to the person or just kind of describe. And when I taught my brother, I never thought that, you know, I could uh, make him familiar with something different than the rose, because uh, he was a very kind person, the woman liked him, he was very kind for any person in the world, and he also liked the garden, and everything grew beautiful for him. So, this is my brother, and this is the way I remember him. So, face kind of uh, young, but you know, I know that he had kind of bird, so I make this, uh, you know, stick something which looks like a bird. And uh, so, this is the portraits of my brother, both of them. And, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, First he look at the rose and the rose in uh, like full bloom when they really bloom very nice for him in his garden. Do we have any questions for you? Were these painted at the same time? Yes, I, I, I always paint the paintings. Uh, I have a stack of uh, several canvases and uh, I never just start on a one till finish. I just work on a collection of the paintings most of the time. So I paint them, you know, at the same time, both of them. Um, well, uh, can you remember expressionism? Is that uh, more of a... Of yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, how I uh, actually work with all my work, that the, I bring the... I maybe have half of the size, but the, one of the smallest, you know, it's, I almost 
like cannot, you know, fit the campuses in Rome, and it's very difficult uh, to transport. I had the friend who was so kind because you have a large car. Yes. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, how we get here today. Uh, one more question. Um, I've seen a lot of your work, but this, this, these two are like really, really different from everything else. The palette's more muted. They're absolutely one. One painter or another. Thank you. you. Have you always painted large scale, and what's it like to be in the middle of a canvas working on it? It's, uh, it's, I always work with the large scale. It's, uh, I'm scared with the small scale. I really cannot like, fit myself in a. Uh, I admire the, the artists who are able to work very compact on a small scale, but. Uh, I cannot create nothing with the small sizes, mm. just everything looks so bad. <laughs> so I always end up with the large one, and uh, I look uh, very much in a, uh, you know, a Renaissance work, uh, when the, um, the draftsman create the object by looking on negative spaces, uh, not just try to draft the, uh, you know, the person. And I thought that the, it's an interesting approach because uh, it's line up more the toward to create than toward to the paint. Because uh, you know you, you never really can be accurate and make a person really happy with the portrait. <laughs> it's very difficult, uh, you know, task to do. So I rather. Um, you know, looking, or if the person looking, uh, what you can create from the person, how the person, you know, affect uh, you, or, you know, connection with the person, then uh, really just uh, depict the exact future. So, if, uh, if uh, any of you guys want to take a chance, welcome to my place, and I can try to create something from you. <laughs> Any other questions? So, with large pieces like this, especially abstract pieces, when I look at something like this, I try to view it in different ways. I take one moment to look at it and just get the reaction. I take another moment to look at all the details. And then my last moment is trying to hear from the artist and learn about that. And you brought that today. You know? It gave me an experience, and I can look at these pieces over and over again. When you're painting, do you have moments in the painting that you are drawn to, or that you like a little bit more? Or for you, is it the overall idea? It's overall. It's if the overall paintings work, then I decide that it's finished. I, uh, I'm getting very distracted to, to work on a detail. It's another word. Uh, you know, like uh, the dream that you, you can uh, make the painting by one, one gesture, but it's like, you know, every future is very complicated, but you use just splash of the paint to depict it. So it's, you know, what I said, this Akura glue was perfect for eyes because I just splash and I got his eyes. So, uh, you know, sometimes you, you really attract to the sun uh, color and uh, it's like you, you bring one uh, nice pieces to the room and how you start to decorate how you are from, you know, so it's the same with the painting. You just get first uh, splash and uh, then, you know, you work over, uh, over it. I have one final question for you. Um, and that would be, you work very large on all of your pieces. Uh, can we expect to see smaller prints at any time in the future, or do you want to keep just originals? I never really, you know, uh, I never really ever promote my work, or I just think about, uh, you know, the market. Maybe I. We would have to start now because I can't long, uh, long do not work with the uh, industry I worked before. But um, no, I, I think the the alike original. 
it's maybe even though the price seems high, but uh, with the present prices, just everything is so high. Yeah. You know, with canvas and paint and uh, you know all the things. You know. If, if you were to sell things, if your brother said that, I don't want them. How much would you sell? The, 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 I just said the price seven thousand, but uh, each. Each, uh, each one. But uh, right now, they, if you like it, so I'm gonna find a way to ship it. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm sorry to announce that, but uh, I have similar artwork that uh, I, I can, uh, you know, paint uh, portraits if anyone is interested in things like that. Anyone else? Were you nervous when you showed it to your brother at all, or were you pretty confident he liked it? Or? No, I was surprised that he liked it. I thought he wanted it. <laughs> 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 yes, it's like, it's got to be some other taste. But, uh, Probably, like, he, he waits so long that uh, I'm going to finally get some portrait for him that he, I don't know if he really likes, but he said, oh, I love it. <laughs> so. Any other questions? All right, Yua, thank you so much. <laughs> All right,